Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Biz Books, where I talk to great authors who wrote great business books. My name is Gene Marks. I appreciate you watching and listening on all the different places where we are broadcast. And by the way, guys, uh, before I even introduce you, and I know we're live, but this will be you know, it's on our YouTube channel. This goes out on my LinkedIn. It goes out through Twitter and Facebook. So a lot of people uh, will be hopefully watching and, and listening to this. And hopefully that means that a lot of people will be buying your book. The book is called Self-Made Boss, Advice, Hacks, and Lessons from Small Business Owners. And I have with me Jackie Reeses and Lauren Weinberg. Jackie, let me, first of all, you guys are both um, you know, um, you know, survivors of Square, correct? Is that? <laughs> I wouldn't call it a survivor. <laughs> We're proud people who worked. At, I worked at Square. Lauren still works there. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great to hear. And uh, and we don't even do we call it Square anymore, or is it Block? Is there is there like a different Lauren? What is the uh, how do we so block is the name of the overall like entity, the corporate company, but square is the division within block and I still work at square. So we still say square. Got it. And Lauren, what makes me laugh is that you're on the marketing side, correct? Yeah. So this has probably been like, <laughs> probably given the speech a thousand times, right? In the past, you know, in the past couple of months. Um, so, okay. Well, I'm going to still read refer to it as square because that's how I've always known it. And that that's is great. Funny. Yeah. But Lauren, um, again, you're on the marketing side. Jackie, tell us uh, what, what were you doing at Square and, and what are you doing now? If I can ask. So I'm the CEO of a technology company that builds banking infrastructure. Okay. Um, and it's really oriented in a B2B way towards crypto and fintech companies. And while I was at Square, um, I ran banking and lending for small businesses. Great. All right, good. So both of you guys have a lot of experience working with small businesses. Um, you know, Square is a, it, it's a great company and used by many of my clients. So you've taken all of this experience now and you're putting it into this book. Again, the title is Self-Made Boss Advice, Hacks and Lessons from Small Business Owners. What's very unique and cool about this book, which I, I enjoyed so much, is that you really draw on actual real life, you know, you know, breathing small business owners, you know, I mean, there are some experts and pundits included in here as well, but uh, getting the advice from people that are really in the trenches is, is, is really great stuff. So uh, you know, Lauren, I'll, you know, just starting with you, like, how did this book even come about? What gave you guys the idea? Yeah. So a couple of things. One is, um, well, I'm in on the East coast now, but this book kind of came to life when Jackie and I were both in California and um like most other people during the pandemic, we spent some time walking around outside because there wasn't that much else to do. And we, we'd we always had this observation that there was just a void of really practical and pragmatic advice for small business owners. We also both spend a lot of time speaking to small business owners and felt like they have a ton of wisdom and insights to share and we know, um, I think just from speaking to small business owners and also just from both of our experiences, like in running our own businesses, that it can feel really lonely. And we thought, what if we could package up a lot of the things that these like incredible business owners have learned over the years so that as other people are going through some of these challenges, because there's a lot of consistent themes that we hear about all the time that there was a place that they could go, like a practical advice, a guide that's actually told from the perspective of other business owners so that they didn't have to feel like they were reinventing the wheel every time. It can feel very lonely to be a business owner. And so we thought this book kind of creates a sense of community, gives a lot of really practical and pragmatic advice that we thought would be helpful to millions of small business owners. And I'll let Jackie share more about her perspective on that as well. But I also think we we sort of felt like the timing, right? During a pandemic, when people are, were out of work is often a time where we see a lot of new business starts. And so we thought it would be a good time to put something like this together. Yeah, Jackie. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, Jackie. you, you, when you travel around the country and you listen to the people who really occupy 30 million small businesses in the United States, two thirds of the job growth, I mean, everybody's Main Street America, and yep. you listen to them talk about how they run their business. 
you realize that they learn best from each other. And the wisdom that's shared amongst the small business community can get translated from business type to business type. And so it's not like if you're a plumber, it doesn't apply to a beauty salon. And interestingly, that advice is so needed because there really aren't any guides to help these companies pragmatically. You know, if you're a hot dog stand, how do you learn how to do social media? How do you learn how to get a loan? And so kind of translating those stories in a very real way to an execution oriented approach was something that we thought was super important for this community. How did you, Jackie, how did you guys choose you know, the, the people that you that participated in this book? You know, um, so we thought about it like casting, right? Meaning we wanted small business owners that came from different industries, different geographies, different backgrounds, so that when you read the book, you had a breadth of experiences to hear from. And so, you know, we had the benefit of knowing a lot of these small businesses that are included in the book already. So we knew that they had unique wisdom to share. Right. And then we augmented that by making sure we had representation everywhere. You know, like you've got someone who's in the olive oil business, you've got an oyster farmer, you've got a uh, e-commerce company, you've got a property manager, you've got a steel company. And so they're from all over the country. And we pulled together that wisdom, not by business type, but by functional area of expertise. So HR, ops, legal, marketing, finance, so that when you have a business topic that you need to learn from, you could pick up a chapter of the book, read it, and you learn from the businesses that are in there because they're actually pretty good at telling these um, problems in their topic. But in addition to that, you have experts who we augmented the chapter with. So you had a framework for how to think about the problem. All right, let's talk about some of those experts first. And Lauren, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. And just so you guys know, because for, for purposes of time here, I went through, your, your, your book is really from the beginning to the end life cycle of a business. I mean, you're, you, know, you start with taking the first step and writing a business plan and figuring out your legal organization of a business and getting yourself up and running and you know, you know, the basics of finance all the way to succession planning you know, and potentially selling your business. So it's a big, you know, it's a big arc, you know, of of what you guys are covering. My audience, for the most part, are employer-owned businesses. So, you know, we, the people that that listen to me or or watch this are, you know, people that have, they're running family-owned businesses, companies that have employees that necessarily didn't just start up yesterday. And and I I wanted wanted to focus on some of the content in your book focus that, that, that's for existing businesses. Um, and so Lauren, you know, you, Jackie mentioned about you guys, you're drawing on some experts. So, you know, you have your whole, your, your section, a whole area of, of, of your know, brand building and marketing, oh. and you draw upon the opinions of experts. There's, I made note, you know, Kathy Savitt is a, a marketer, you know, Ingrid Case is a writer. Andy Montgomery is a website designer. And, uh, you know, uh, Andre Laro from Reading and Write is a photographer. These are all like, you know, experts that help small businesses. And um, so for you, Lauren, like, and I, I wanted your, your, your thoughts on dealing with outside experts if you are a small business owner, you know, how do you choose the right expert to work with? Um, how do you pay them? How do you know that they're you know, like Kathy Savitt is a marketer and Alan White, you know, runs a marketing agency. If I'm going to hire any of these experts, how do I, how should I go about doing that? Can you give me some of your thoughts on that one? Yeah. I mean, I think that the truth is, is that most small business owners wouldn't necessarily hire any of those experts. And I think the reason that we put them in the book is because, you know, Kathy Savid is, is someone that Jackie and I have both known for a long time. She was the CMO of Yahoo. She's now the CEO of Boom Supersonic Jets. And so she's probably not somebody that like these small business owners would be able to hire, but she has a lot of just like 
wisdom and knowledge and experience. And, and so I think what we tried to do in the book is really introduce some of these people that you maybe typically wouldn't have access to. So I'll just say right. that to begin with. But when you are thinking about an expert, I think I would, I would say like, we talk about this a little bit in the hiring book too, which is when do you think about a freelancer or someone to consult and guide you versus when you need a full-time employee? And I think this is really like case by case dependent on what each business needs. So for example, like if you don't have anyone to run your marketing, you may want to talk to someone initially just to give you some guidance on how to get up and running. And I would say the the amazing thing right now is that we have this gigantic creator economy. Yeah. There are people that are experts in creating video content, creating content for TikTok. And so I would say like, if it's a marketing specific topic, for example, that those people are great people to tap into because they understand how to really use those platforms. And some of those people you can actually find through some of the platforms. So TikTok and YouTube, for example, they have, they make it easy for businesses to be able to access and connect with some of these creators. And so I would say that's one place to start. But I think the question for businesses to ask themselves is, is this work temporary work? Is it something that I just need an hour of somebody's time? Or is this something that I'm going to need every day or every week to help you decide whether it's like an advisor, it's an employee? Um, one of the things I think we talk about a lot is one of the things that will hold a business back is not knowing when to hire. And so we give a couple of like tips and advice in the book on when to think about hiring. And so if there's if you own your business and there's something that you should be spending your time on that is going to enable your business to grow, but you don't ever get to it because let's just say, for example, in the marketing realm, you're spending all of your time writing content for social media. Then I think that would be a case where you might say, it's probably worth it to at least try hiring either a freelance or a part-time employee and somebody to do some of that work for you so that you can actually put your time and attention onto um, more important things that you need to focus on to really help your business grow. You, you highlight two people in the book, Andre and Andy, yep. who I think are really interesting because they're in two mm -hmm. areas of expertise that small business owners should think about. Mm -hmm. Andre is a photographer mm -hmm. and he gives amazing advice on how to take photos of your business for social media and your website, mm -hmm. absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And it might be one of those things that you say like, what I have is fine. Well, if it's fine, it's probably not good enough. Time to really think through how to improve how you present yourself and change either the composition of the inventory you're showing or even your brand image itself. Andy Montgomery is a designer. He's actually the chief design officer of Robinhood, the finance app. Right. And so Andy is a consumer design expert. Right. And his point of view uh, provided in the book is how to think about creating a logo and a brand to make your business represented in a more attractive way. And they're all signals, you know, and they're signals both to your external customer base and also to your internal employee base. Mm. Both are really important constituents for your business. And Jackie, wouldn't you also say that, you know, you're coming from a financial end, it's, this is not necessarily a targeted return on investments if you're hiring any of these people. This is branding. This is image for your company. So if you were to hire somebody like an Andy Montgomery, who's a website designer, and I'm not selling just, just him in particular, but somebody that's experienced, uh, you know, it's not like you're going to spend, you know, you, you might spend, a, you know, a few thousand dollars with that person to design a great website for you. It's not like that's going to immediately turn into leads or turn into, you know, uh, you know, sales that will justify the cost. A lot of the people that you mentioned here are, these are soft costs that you're paying for because you're, you're investing in your brand. Is that, Jackie, does that make sense? Lauren should be the, the better person to answer these yeah. Okay. You have the expert on here. Yeah. So I would say, I think that 
In some ways, yes. But I also, the way that I would think about those, um, and if I was running my own business and I have before, is that every single encounter touch point somebody has with your brand is really a chance for you to form a relationship with them. And so, yes, it may not be like directly measurable, but it is all of those little things. So what does your logo look like? What colors do you use? What does your website look like? What does your storefront look like? What does your right. front window look like? What does the, what are the people that you hire and the way that they engage with your customers? Like, what is the feeling that they leave your customers with? Because every single time that somebody has that interaction with your brand is an opportunity for you to build loyalty. And those things over time equate to real value for your business. And so it is a harder to quantify thing. It's not as kind of quick as I put up a promotion and I immediately see more people coming to my business and an increase in sales. But I would say that it is something that is fundamental to your business. And, and I would just say like encouraging everyone from the very beginning to just consider how everything about your business and the way people feel about it, because then they're more likely to talk to other people about it. If somebody has an amazing experience with your products or your services, they're going to talk about you. And that's the best kind of marketing because A, it's free and it's also extremely credible. Like hearing from somebody that you trust, this is the best carpenter. He did amazing work in my house. I highly recommend him is better than any ad that someone can see on Facebook or any other platform. And so so I hear you what you're saying. And yes, in some ways, it's a little bit of a less measurable cost, but I believe fundamentally that the value and the return is a hundred percent there. And it's all those little details that actually really make a huge difference for a small business owner. Lauren, what did you learn um, from the people that you interviewed about, you know, where they're spending their money and we're, we'll get off of marketing and branding in just a minute, but um, one of the biggest issues that, um, you know, my clients are always facing is, you know, they have, you're a small business, you have a limited marketing budget and there's just all these different places. I mean, you guys mentioned in the book, there's SEO, there's, you know, you're marketing through your customers, there's email or SMS marketing, there's traditional advertising, there's earned media. It's like, we just don't have all the resources to, to spend on all those places, you know? So I'm, I'm curious, not only Lauren, what you learned from some of the people that you spoke to for this book, but also, listen, I mean, you know, you, you have a, a major marketing job at a, a, you know, at a large tech company as well. What advice do you have for businesses when they're trying to figure out where to spend their marketing dollars? Like what's best for them? Um, yeah. What advice would you give? So I would say it starts with understanding your audience and where your audience spends time. I think that it's, it, it's almost impossible for a small business owner to be everywhere. Like I have a very large marketing team and we're still not on every single platform because to do it right, you need to be thinking about a way that you are like really authentic in those platforms. So my advice would be to pick a few to begin with, right? There's, and I think part of it is understanding your audience. Where do they spend time? You obviously want to spend your time where your customers are spending their time and you don't want to be on a platform that your customers are never on. So that's kind of rule number one. I think the second thing really depends on the kind of business that you run as well. So if you have some type of like retail business, then Instagram is a great platform for you because there's a lot of opportunity for commerce there. If you are a personal trainer, right, TikTok and some of the other more video um, heavy platforms might be a better platform for you to be on. So a lot of it really depends on if it's if you're like a consultant or an advisor and there's more text content or articles that you're sharing, maybe Twitter and Facebook are a better platform for you. So I think it's really two things, which is knowing your audience and also what type of business that you run. If you run a restaurant, right? Like we talked about how we have Andre talking about how to photograph your food in the best way. But, you know, Instagram's obviously a very visual platform. People love their food porn. They want to see pictures of everything that you're making. And so I think it, it really depends on those two things. And my advice would be to not try to be everywhere. And then once you figure out 
where you want to be to develop a content calendar to, to make it less overwhelming. So you could say, okay, I'm going to post three times a week to get started on Mondays. I'm going to talk about like my story and how I got into business because people really do love to understand the backstory, who you are, why should they be in business with you? Mm. On Wednesdays, you may talk about promotions. On Fridays, you might be talking about employees. And so you can develop a calendar that makes it a little bit easier so you know exactly what you're going to do. And if you have a really busy season coming up, you can actually pre-write and have some of your content ready to go. So it's just a matter of posting it when that day and time comes. All right, great answer. All right, Lisa, I could talk marketing with you all day. And and there was, you know, the, the entire chapter in, in you know in branding and marketing was excellent. Um, but there's too much other stuff to talk about in this book. So let's talk about people. Okay. Um, Jackie, I'm gonna pick on you for this one. And if you're, you know, if you want to defer over uh, back to Lauren, that's fine. But I hopefully not. Um, yeah, there, there, there's a whole great chapter about what uh, some of the small businesses that you spoke to, what they're doing. Uh, to deal with hiring in HR. And, you know, we know it's a huge labor shortage right now, 11 and a half million unfilled jobs. Everybody's looking to find workers and also to uh, retain workers as well. So just a few of the people, Jackie, that you guys you guys profiled. One person was Megan Jones-Bell, uh, the clinical director of mental health at Google, which is a job I would not want to ever have. Uh, but uh, Megan talks about mental health issues. And I was wondering if you could, you know, maybe talk a little bit about mental health um, and why it's important for business owners to to recognize that issue, both as a way to uh, to provide the right kind of benefits to their employees and, and retain their employees. Absolutely. So um, I think this is one of those topics in HR and culture in general that a lot of small business owners generally think about, but don't actually take affirmative action to say, I need to make sure that I am designing my programs actively Mm -hmm. and not by default. And there's a big difference between those two approaches. You know, everything around how you approach the conversations and execution with your employees really matters to deal with hiring and retention. It makes who you are as an employer. So it's absolutely critical. And even, you know, you're talking about mental health, designing benefits for employees imply something about who you are. And I don't think people think about that enough. Meaning when you design even your healthcare packages for employees, are you implying that your employees have families, don't have families? Mm. You know, you, (coughs) excuse me, you want to deal with fertility, you don't want to, it all really matters as to what you're trying to telegraph about who you are. Mental health is one of those really important topics, particularly now where (laughs) it's a hot button of um, issues because of what's happening across the country, particularly post pandemic, where you're seeing the needs for mental health professionals skyrocket. And so there's lots of ways to think about those benefits. One on like a general level, like, are you trying to just give your employees apps that they can access around mindfulness and general mental health care? Or are you making sure that you have additional support in your healthcare benefits associated with mental health? Mm -hmm. There's a whole spectrum of opportunities that you can pursue But the most important thing that a small business owner should do is just make sure they're thinking about it. And so go through benefit by benefit or even how you operate your company and say, what does this mean about me? And is this what I want to project? Is this who I want to be? And if not, go change it. It's a great, it's a great point. And, you know, listen, I don't know how old you guys are and don't need to know, but, you know, I'm in my fifties there is a generational thing when it comes to mental health, you know, and uh, people that are, you know, you know, my age, it's, it's not something that was talked about a lot as we were, you know, working in companies and uh, you know, nowadays it is. And, you know, you know, 50% of the workforce is, you know, gen X, you know, gen, gen Z and millennials, and it's not a stigma anymore. And you've got like Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka and 
Others that are out there talking about their mental health challenges. And you have a generation of younger workers that listen to that and are more open to talk about it. And so you're absolutely right, Jackie, having addressing that issue uh, and making sure it's there. This is not a big company kind of thing. This is something that small businesses need to be doing as well. And and you can do it inexpensively, like even just getting a corporate uh, membership to apps that are around meditation or wellness. Like yeah. there are great ways that you can you can manage these benefits in in a way that's that's cost effective for anybody, and so they're super important now, um, regardless of how deep you go into the spectrum. But even just thinking about it means something to people. Right. It means that you're making a choice that you want to make sure you're focused on the whole employee and not just if they break their arm or have some physical kind of ailment. Because you're going to be asked about it and you've got to have a response because that's people are asking about it nowadays. And you mentioned the platforms. You're absolutely right. There was one. Um, Fringe is very good. And Better Up is another really great. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that platform as well. And, you know, it provides you pay like a corporate fee and then uh, you know, your employees can have private confidential conversations with you know trained therapists. I think Better Up has uh, I think Prince Harry is one of the backers of Better Up, but not not Meghan Markle. So it's fine. Okay. We well, can... Better Up does coaching. And yeah, that's also coaching. an important topic. Like you want to show employees that you care about making them smarter and better at their job. Getting someone coaching is a really important signal. Yep. <coughs> Sorry. Better Up does that on a tech platform. So it's more cost effective for companies to pursue than actually hiring an external coaching staff. And so it's a really important way to get people support to improve at what they do in their day job. I've done it. I've actually used better up right when they started. Um, We use the services. I thought it was really helpful. Um, But there are lots of options in the coaching front as well. And we actually have a coach interviewed in the book, an executive named Ron Beller, Mm -hmm. who is an executive coach of CEOs. There's all different kinds of coaches that you can get for your employees. I think if I step back from that also, one of the philosophies that I think is really important for a company to pursue is that if you can make every employee in your company 5% better every year, Mm. think about how much better your entire company will be. And I love that ethos. And so even thinking about like, what do you do for learning? What do you do to, <clears throat> to promote education in a way that's pragmatic and tangible for the job, not just theoretical? That can have an incredibly important impact on how your business operates year over year. And I just want to be you know, just clear for all of you guys watching this, that this is, this is a small business issue. This is not you know, some kind of corporate wellness thing. I'm seeing clients of all different sizes of mine that are, you know, are investing in platforms like BetterUp and Fringe and, uh, you know, talking to their health insurance providers, making sure they've got mental health benefits. It's an issue trying to find people. And this is a big, you know, this is a big requested benefit. Lauren, I'm going to turn to you. There's, you know, you guys featured a business owner in the book, um, Elon Peso, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, who runs an ice cream store in New York and talked about finding employees. And um, I wanted to just get your thoughts on about finding employees for, I mean, this is, it's, you know, you ask any small business owner around the country and they will tell you right now, their biggest issues, of course, is inflation and supply chain and people, you know, um, what are your thoughts on finding employees? What did you learn from Elon? What do you, you know, what, what do you do? Yeah. So I, I think, and I think the last conversation that we were just having is really critical to the point about finding employees, because we've definitely seen people shifting around a lot a lot of people, you know, wanting to be really intentional about where they work. And there's a lot of job opportunities right now. And so, yeah, it's very hard for business owners to find staff and to keep that staff, which is why having all those benefits and finding people that really care about what you're doing is really critical. So we learned a couple things from some of the folks that we interviewed. And so, you know, Elon talks a lot about just making sure, like if you work in an ice cream store, 
And you're going to have to be like, there's some physical requirements there too, which is people need to be able to walk up and down the stairs, like carrying these like kind of heavy containers of ice cream and you're on your feet all day. And so I think they're definitely looking for a certain kind of person there. We also talked to Mark Bash, who runs a restaurant in New York, and he talked a lot about his hiring philosophy and they've owned multiple restaurants between Mark and his brother, John. And I've hired over like 500 people throughout the years. And what he said is he really likes to find people who are like really early on in their career, maybe don't have a ton of experience, but they're very like loyal to him. He likes to train them in his way. And he likes to see people kind of rise through the ranks in his organization from bus boy all the way up to manager, because he wants to make sure that people are doing things the way that he likes to. And I think for me personally, like I, I love that idea of like, I think if you take a chance on someone, they're very likely to be loyal to you. And I think finding people that actually care about the things that you do and are passionate about it is the other thing that's really important. And then making it a good work environment. So your culture as a company and your brand, those things should be connected, right? If you have a wellness store, then hopefully you really are prioritizing like your employees wellness and, yeah. and you have those benefits. And so I think a lot of it really comes down to like, I mean, and to be honest, like small business owners are incredibly scrappy about how they find people. I've talked to people over the years, caterers, for example, that love to hire ballet dancers. Why? Because they're very disciplined. They're always on time. And so they like do their recruiting through ballet schools in their area. And so it's kind of like, huh. it's one of the things that I think why Jackie and I wanted to write this book is like, you hear these kind of like hacks and yeah. tricks yeah. and you're like, I never would have thought about that, but people have been doing these things and learning these things along the way. And so I think that there's you know, everybody's going to do it a little bit differently, but I would say like giving people a chance, finding people that care about what you care about, and then making sure that you actually create a culture, which I do think maybe, you know, five, 10 years ago, small business owners didn't have to think about, but now this is something that no matter what size your business is, if you're not providing a good experience for employees, they're not going to stay with you. And so we, we, we saw a lot of that in the book and one last example is just Keith Miller from Bubbly Paws because he cares a lot about this. And he talks about giving employees reviews. He has a dog grooming business, making sure that people have like mats to stand on so that their feet don't hurt. Like to me, that's an example of a small gesture that goes a long way. It shows that you really care about the people that are working for you. You recognize like what are the hard parts about the job? And you're actually providing solutions and just these little things that can go a very long way. You know, one and last you, hack. Yeah, go ahead. I I've got a hack. I got a hack for you as well. So you do yours and I'll do mine. Go ahead. Okay. So the Lauren mentioned the way um, um, Mark Bash hires and how, and, and, and so the one other thought to add into the equation is whether you're actually understanding what the person is good at mm. versus what's on their resume. Mm. Because you can translate a lot of skills to different jobs in completely different fields of work. So long as you say, you know what, someone who's good at this might actually be great at executing this kind of job. So for example, could a head of sales be an amazing recruiter. Right. So a head of sales is really good at selling the product, sure. but if recruiting internally is becoming more important for you, maybe you take someone who's amazing at that other job and say, if you can sell external, you can sell internal too. Yeah. And yeah. so it's a great way to think about a hack about core expertise so that you can open up the aperture of who you can look at as a potential employee. You know, it's funny that you say that, Jake, because even, again, you're a finance, I'm a CPA. If you haven't figured it out by, by my look, I'm a CPA. Uh, and I know um, uh, uh, there, there's a big trend, particularly with larger corporations, of bringing in financial people on the marketing end because marketing has become so data-driven. So like your example of like, hey, you've got somebody's director of sales, they should be in charge of recruiting because 
that's we're trying to sell people to come and work for us. Uh, we have other people that might have a good experience in finance and accounting. And maybe if you're a data-driven business, maybe that might be a good person to, you know, mining that data to help you with your marketing efforts. Because I'm seeing that, you know, in corporate America. And I have one other hack for you guys. I, there was a guy who's interviewed. I, I met him actually at a conference. It was like a Windows and Doors conference like a year ago. He said like he never has problems finding employees because he's always looking out um, wherever he goes. Like when he goes to restaurants, when he goes to retail stores, he's like, you know how like, I don't know if you guys are like me, like I, I don't really pay attention to like my server other than giving my order and, you know, and that's that, you know, you're focused on your meal. He pays attention to the people serving him in stores and restaurants because he's like, he stumbles upon really great people, you know, young people that yeah. have got energy and great attitude and are really good. He's like, listen, I could teach anybody how to sell windows and doors. I, I just can't teach people to have that kind of attitude. You know what I mean? Um, and that great was another example. Yeah. Great example. I think things like that really matter because you're, you're, you're pursuing people who have fundamental traits as to who they are versus an actual skill. And there's a big difference between the two. You know, one, you don't have to look at their resume. You could just yep. understand who they are and what they're good at. And everybody has a spike of something they're amazing at. And it might have nothing to do with their resume. Right. Right. Yeah. And like I said, you know, and, and like you guys are referring to, I mean, there's no, there's no uniqueness in a business that, that can't be taught. It's, it's finding the person that's got, you know, the right skill set, personal skills to do that. All right. So that's great, great chapter. And I learned a lot about hiring and, and taking care of your employees. Um, I'd like to talk to you guys about, you know, the chapter that you wrote about roadblocks. So Lauren, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you now. And first of all, let's sort of like introduce the concept, if that's okay with you. You, you, you guys write about roadblocks. What do you mean by roadblocks? I mean, by, I think what we mean by roadblocks is just the things that pop up and it's like inevitable. Every business is going to have something that gets in their way of being successful. So it could be anything from they're doing construction on your street and you lose foot traffic. During the pandemic, if you, you know, we talked to Pete Stein a lot. He's an oyster farmer who was selling directly to restaurants in New York. And then all the restaurants shut Went down. Away. Yeah. So that was a big roadblock for him, right? And so he had to think about how is he going to continue to make money and provide for his family. And he ended up developing a direct-to-consumer model. And so the idea is that there's every week, Probably for a small business owner somewhere, there's something that pops up that's going to feel like an obstacle um, in your way of being successful. And I think one of the things like we were really adamant about this chapter, because this is, I think, one of the things that we see small business owners do best, which is navigate yeah. the gazillions of roadblocks. Like your cappuccino maker could break on the day that you're opening a coffee shop. I mean, you name it it's definitely happened to somebody. And so the idea here is kind of picking the people whose stories that we found to be like extraordinarily compelling about how they navigated those roadblocks. That You're absolutely right. And it's funny you talk about business owners being able to do that. I, mean, I write um, every week for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And, um, you know, so over the past year, you know, I've been covering stuff about obviously the pandemic and supply chain and all that. And you know, I don't know, maybe it would surprise you, maybe it wouldn't, but it just it, countless people that I interviewed that run little businesses that, you know, like, okay, well, we ran out of this. So instead we sold that, you know, <laughs> or, you know, we couldn't get this product in. So we convinced our product too, that we can supply them with that instead. Like they just, and maybe it's because you're, you're in a small business, you don't have a your, your red tape to go through or a bureaucracy. You could just, you know, make decisions and move on them quicker. Um, Lauren, you, you, you mentioned that there are some people like some unique stories. And I, I'm, I'm hoping maybe um, I could jog your memory to talk about a few of them. Um, you, you, one person that you, you feature in the book was a guy named Andrew Hypes, um, who's a DJ and a producer. And, you know, he sells, you know, adjacent products. So, you know, can, can you expand on that? Or, you know, and Lauren, if, you know, maybe, or Jackie, I don't know which one of yeah, you guys. Yeah, I can talk about Andrew. He's sure. a, a DJ, very cool. He, he, I think is like the hipster of the book. <laughs> um, when you read a little bit about him and, um, you know, if you're a DJ at events in the middle of the pandemic, 
you have to adjust what you're doing. So are you teaching music? Are you teaching how to work soundboards in the middle of a pandemic? Mm. And he's a perfect example of someone who had to pivot their business model in order to deal with a dramatic change of business circumstances. And I think that idea of pivoting is super important because we do see that generally where people have to adjust either inventory, how they sell, tools they use, you know, how they talk to customers. So all of those components of pivoting a business, super important for business owners to control and really think about because if you start to feel that you're getting product market fit around something, or there's a tool that can make your business more effective in one way or another, you absolutely have to kind of listen to that signal and then react and make the change. And so, you know, one of the things we saw in the pandemic was um, small businesses more willing to take technology tools that enable, <coughs> excuse me, I have this awful cough, yep. enable them to get online or operate their business in a curbside way. And those were tools that they might have delayed pre-pandemic. And you immediately saw a platform shift yep. so that they could pivot their business and take advantage of what was out there. And sometimes those, those platform shifts can be incredibly important for a business owner to embrace so that they could get ahead of the changes that they need to pursue in order to make their business more effective or target different customers. It's amazing how necessity is the mother of invention, <laughs> you know? And, you know, when you have to pivot, you pivot if you want to stay in business. Um, you guys also focused on that chapter a lot about diversification. Um, you talked about, and, and Lauren, I'll, I'll, I'll direct this question to you. There was uh, one woman, Ilana Walensky, who does jewel branding and licensing. She, she focused on diversifying her products because she was seeing falls off in sales in one uh, versus another. And then you feature a guy named Min Park, who's an investor in restaurants. And he invests in, you know, he, he looks for geographical diversity uh, for where he's investing. So, you know, Lauren, can, talk to us a little bit about diversifying your business um, so that you can overcome potential roadblocks. Yeah, I, that's a great question. And I think that one of the things that amazed me about what we saw during the pandemic was that it, it's sort of exactly what Jackie's saying, which is it forced people to diversify their business. And the good thing about that is that they they got put into a situation where it was like adapt or die, basically, right? And so if you can't adapt your business, you're not going to survive this time. What's incredible about that is that as the world starts to reopen, what a lot of business owners have realized is that they now have additional revenue streams. And so I think that's one of like the silver linings that came out of the pandemic is that when a lot of physical locations closed, people pivoted to online. And we've seen a lot of our like merchants, even on the square side that realized that their e-commerce business could actually be 10 X what their in-person business is, yeah. which changes the entire way they think about their business. And so I think that the diversifying your revenue streams is obviously a really important part of this. And I think we saw a lot of business owners do that during the pandemic. And now that they're sort of back operating in the real world, they actually have higher revenue than they did before the pandemic because they have multiple revenue streams. And so this is a really important idea and actually a concept I think that we've seen all along in businesses. If you have a retail store, do you use that space at night potentially for um, some type of like classes or gatherings, right? We see a lot of people like you have a retail store and a coffee shop, both in one, you have a restaurant and you sell merchandise. Right. And so I think this is a really important thing that we see a lot of small business owners do. And one of the reasons I think why Jackie and I both love small business owners so much is that they're the best at this, right? Yep. Like they are really passionate about what they do. They're super resilient. They have the most grit of anyone I've ever seen sort of operate because they want to be successful. And so they're much more likely to make these quick pivots. There isn't as much bureaucracy because a lot of it isn't working in a large organization. And so this is a really critical component, I think, to, to 
and, and, and a trend that we see, I think just continuing to multiply, we have a term for it at Square. It's not very like fancy, but we basically call them like multi-hyphenate businesses. Like they're not just one thing. They're actually multiple things in one because that gives them the best opportunity for success because they have multiple revenue streams. Well, Lauren, just, you know, you know, the, my biggest concern about doing that, and you're absolutely right. It is something I think it's essential and business owners are, are well positioned to do it, but there, there, we all have to be aware there is a potential branding issue as well, you know, right? So, you know, because if you diversify, if you're selling something that's really disconnected from maybe what your core products are, or product lines are, um, it, it, it could impact what people might think about your business or what you do. Does that make sense? And do you have any thoughts on that? It does, but I would say generally we see people diversifying in ways that feel really authentic to their business. So if you have a restaurant and people love your restaurant or you're an establishment that's been around for 40, 50 years and you start selling, like, let's just say you have a barbecue spot and people really love your sauce and you start selling your sauce or you start selling t-shirts, those are all things that feel like natural extensions where you're taking your like food based business and also establishing a retail component. Like if you're a stylist in a salon, but you also offer like classes around that. I mean, I would say mostly what we see are people diversifying in areas that are very on brand for them. So I worry less about the fact that it creates a really confusing experience. And I think probably the advice there is to be thinking about the areas. And this is the same career advice I give to people on my team all the time, which is like, if you're in your lane and there's something that's right next to you and it's really easy to grab, go for that thing first, as opposed to like things that are 10 lanes over where it's really hard to make the connection. I think that would be harder for people to manage and also harder for your customers to understand like, that feels random. Like, why would you be doing that? And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to diversify that is very authentic and related to your like initial core proposition. You know, it drives me nuts is when I, um, you, you ever see like the, uh, the restaurants, there'll be like Asian restaurants and they'll sell like Chinese food and sushi and Thai, you know, <laughs> I think to myself, like you're diversifying, this, but there's only different countries and different cultures, but they're all like, under one umbrella, but it seems to work, you know, because those restaurants seem popular. So uh, what do I know? Jackie, and, and we're going to, we'll, we'll wind up in just a few minutes, guys. And this has been great. And, and like I said, I've learned so much, but um, Jackie, let me, let me ask you this next question. Why is it okay to be small? You know, <clears throat> Some people want a certain lifestyle and they want that lifestyle because it helps them with control. Yeah. There is absolutely no reason why you can't be a sole proprietor, have an incredible life that feels more successful to you. It enables you to do what you want to do while still remaining small. And I think there's a really important fork in the road for a lot of businesses in that very decision itself, which is, do I want to just run a business for my own lifestyle or do I want to grow? And often that is a trigger point for somebody when they have to start thinking about whether they start to hire new employees and build their business. And it's something that usually small business owners internalize and really spend a lot of time on. Super important question. But, you know, there are 23 million sole proprietors in the United States. So there are a lot of people who agree with your question that yeah. they want to stay small. Yeah. And a lot of people also, um, if you can look yourself in the mirror and realize whether or not you have the skill set to run a bigger company, it might be really great running a business that's doing half a million a year. Um, but, you know, maybe you're not the kind of person that can run a business doing five million a year. Yeah. Um, so maybe it does make sense to stay small. Okay, Lauren, back to you. Who is your favorite interview in this book and why? Oh, I, it's always hard to pick your favorite child. Um, that's really hard for me to answer for a couple of reasons because <laughs> a lot of my, my college roommates and my dad are, are all in this book. Um, but if I had to pick one, I probably would say Peter Stein. 
Um, I think Peter Stein was a great interview. We used him in multiple chapters. I think yeah. he's the oyster farmer. And um, he was the one that talked to us about a just like really gave us a lot of in-depth knowledge about oyster farming that I had no idea about. And I would say, secondly, he talked a lot about um, the pivots that he made during the pandemic. And I think when we think about small business owners doing really incredible scrappy things, he basically leveraged like software technology that was designed for bus routes to help him optimize his delivery routes when his business pivoted from restaurant to direct to consumer. That's so a pivot. I just really love that example because I think it kind of like really highlights the determination of small business owners. And now he has like his restaurant business, his direct to consumer shipping business. He has like events in the summer. And so um, I think his story is just a really incredible one. Jackie, if you had written this book 20 years ago, how do you think it would have been different? Oh, well, well, I think our approach towards technology in the book is probably the element that provides the most context for how to draw businesses from an analog world to a digital world. Mm. And now there are so many tools available to small businesses in almost every element of their workflow that I think it's an incredible time to embrace a lot of those tools. And sometimes it's workflow that just adds simplicity to their lives. Sure. But I think there are so many opportunities and options right now that that's really the change in looking in 2022 versus, you know, even 10 years ago when the idea of a mobile payment didn't really exist. Yep. And so I think that's the element that's really the most different because the, the fundamentals about grit, determination, deciding whether to start, how to deal with your family you know, how to write a business plan, a lot of those elements are all the same. Yeah, it's a good point. And, you know, it's funny, too, when you talk about, you know, how technology has changed. I think that's what there's been like more than a million, million and a half new business startup applications that occurred since the beginning of the pandemic, because there's a lot of people that want to have side gigs and, you know, work from home employees that had time to do this. And, I don't think they would have been able to do that 20 years ago, if not for the technologies that you mentioned. Yeah, it's actually bigger than that. It's like 4 million. <laughs> um, and it's the highest level of business starts ever. No. ever. Yeah, it's kind of incredible. There are 4.3 million business starts since 2020 alone. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I would say one thing. There's one area that's super important where technology has changed. Um, and we haven't touched on it yet which is the ability to access capital. It's mm. another pain point in addition to HR and marketing <clears throat> where there are so many tools that make it easy to do banking and lending today in context of the tool itself. So it could be accounting software, tax software, sure. point of sale software, that the ability to actually get access for a small business to credit has completely changed. And I think that's a tool that's so critical to small businesses that has completely been upended by the opportunity to choose an online lender mm -hmm. versus having to walk into a bank branch. And so whether it's because you live in a banking desert or because your business is too small, to be able to access a traditional loan of $100,000 or more, there really are incredible opportunities that are super creative that help a small business get financing today. Now you better watch it because Lauren's going to start selling us on uh, Square's merchant advances, right? So, you know, be careful there. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, final question for both of you guys. And Lauren, I'll pick on you first. If you were to quit your job, at Square, not that you would have any intention to, but if you were, and you were going to start up your own small business, what would it be? And Jackie, I'm going to ask you the same question, although you might be on your way to doing that anyway. Uh, but Lauren, let me ask you first, what small business do you think? What, to talk about these people, what really, you know, kind of, you know, excites you? So 
So many things. I mean, but I, I would say for me, I think it would be something very different than what I do at Square. And so if I were to leave and I would just say Square or a corporate job, you'd be an accountant. I would love to start like uh, I love to bake and I love to make flower arrangements. So I would like to start a business where I get to provide desserts and flower arrangements for parties and for people's houses. And so I thought about that a lot. It could be my side hustle. And I maybe call it something like petals and treats. So love it. Love it. All right, Jackie, final word. So I'm doing mine. I am pursuing my dream. And I will tell you, it's really hard. I'm up all night long. Like so many small business owners thinking about it. I wake up in the middle of the night with an idea and I start popping out emails or texts uh, to people who I work with. But I am pursuing um, a banking infrastructure company to change the way fintechs are able to access the banking system. And I love that idea. I love that <clears throat> banking is one of the biggest industries in the United States. It's one of the oldest industries in the United States, and it has the least amount of change. And so I want to take something that's an absolute commodity in a lot of ways and make it interesting and unusual and creative for the businesses that access it. Oh my God, you're exhausting me. I would much rather do the flowers and the cakes thing. It sounds (laughs) a lot less stressful. Um, Jackie Reese is fun. I'm sorry. It's fun. I love what I do. It makes me so happy. I think that's so important. Um, And so I'm completely energized by my team, by my work. It make it it gives me so much energy. It does, and it also creates a lot more stresses too. But that's a conversation for another day, I am sure. Um, Jackie Reese and Warren Weinberg, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, the book is called "Self Made Boss: Advice, Hacks, and Lessons from Small Business Owners." As you guys can tell, we we've been talking almost an hour, and we I've covered like maybe a third of the book. So there's a lot more in it to read all from startup in your business to succession planning and and exiting your business as well. Um, Jackie, Lauren, I'm going to ask you, hang on, even after we, I say my goodbye, so I can say a personal goodbye to both of you guys. Uh, But I want to thank you guys for coming on. It's a great conversation. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yep. Thank you so much for having us. You guys have been listening and watching Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks. Hope you've been enjoying it. We'll be back in two weeks with another great author of another great business book. Thank you so much, and we will see you again soon. Take care.